excited to present to, or to be able to moderate this morning's uh, discussion, which will be on global surgery, which uh, arguably is the is where real innovation happens. And it's my uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers this morning. Uh, we have, and also, uh, by the way, to uh, acknowledge and thank our colleagues at the uh, Bethan Roundtable, which is convening in Halifax, uh, for lending us one of our speakers this morning. So we are, our two speakers are uh, uh, Dr. Dan Pinaro, who is a pediatric surgeon and professor of surgery at McGill University with extensive experience in um, uh, global surgery, as you will hear, and Dr. John Tartley, who is a professor of surgery at Vanderbilt. And again, uh, extensive experience uh, in global surgery. Uh, both have, have a passion for this. Both have been distinguished, uh, having been awarded the uh, humanitarian award, the highest award the American College of Surgeon uh, uh, offers, uh, uh, confers for um, uh, this kind of work. And uh, John gets extra credit because he lives and Vandy's in the central time zone, so he got up an hour earlier than everybody else this morning. So uh, let me start uh, by uh, introducing uh, Dan Pinard. Dan uh, is going to lead off. Um, and uh, so Dan, let me hand it off to you. Thanks very much, Adrian. It's a pleasure to be uh, with all of you here, uh, including everybody that's in this room uh, here at the Bethune Roundtable for uh, Global Surgery. Um, and it's an exciting topic indeed, because we're talking about innovation, not in minimally invasive surgery, but uh, in minimal resource surgery. And uh, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, what we like to do is, uh, I truly believe that um, this is innovation. It's a new idea, a new method. In fact, it is a new discipline that is being forged in front of our eyes. What we want to do over the next um, few minutes is, first of all, clarify the difference between international and global surgery. And uh, really appreciate the surge in global surgery in last years. Uh, also identify the priorities of this new uh, discipline, clinical training and academic priorities. And hopefully in the process, um, really raise an enthusiasm and realism about the potential and future of, um, of global surgery. Next. Next slide, please. So the way we're going to do this is that I'll, I'll start off with um, a, a couple of definitions, just to understand what the topic is and uh, try to bring a little bit of a uh, um, big picture uh, of the under topic. Then John Tarkley will take us back to the ground where, of course, everything happens. Then I'll try to focus a bit on the academic issues and training uh, prerogatives of the discipline. And then finally, uh, John will, uh, uh, will finish with uh, some hopes in the field and warnings at the same time. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. So global surgery, um, a couple of definitions. Um, uh, first one from the Lancet, uh, an area of study, research, practice, and advocacy that places a priority on improving health and achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. And a second def um, definition, a little bit more recent, again, the art and science of surgical practice in pursuit of excellent patient care through the mitigation of the inequity in the distribution of worldwide surgical resources. So you can tell right away that this is the difference from international surgery. The fact that this discipline from the outset has a focus on equity of resources, on, on social justice in a way, uh, for the sake of global, uh, global health care. Next slide. Next, please. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, in terms of how this discipline developed, um, I, I, we don't have time for a true history here, but probably some of the key events that happened, and these, most of these happened just last year in 2015. One of them was the uh, Amsterdam Declaration on Essential Surgical Care, uh, which established those procedures which are required as rights for all people across the world, and they have to have access to these procedures. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other important event was the World Health Assembly Resolution 6815, which focused on uh, surgery, on global surgery, by and the need to provide comprehensive uh, co uh, um, universal coverage. Um, their terms were the safe, affordable, and accessible surgical and anesthetic services. Next slide. Obviously, the main event, the one that most of us know about, is the Lancet Commission, 
which came out last year, um, a tremendous effort which led to several key statements, a number such as 5 billion people who do not have access to safe, affordable surgical care, over 140 million additional procedures that are needed in low-income countries, 33 million people who face catastrophic health expenditures every year because of surgery and anesthesia. But also on the positive side, the fact that investing in surgical services in LMICs is affordable, it saves lives and promotes economic growth. And this ended up with, uh, with the words of the uh, president of the World Bank saying that surgery is an indivisible, indispensable part of health care. Next slide. So this is the picture that the Lancet Commission has painted for us, a picture of a world where, as you can see, most of it in the dark red colors, in fact, does not have access, appropriate access to surgery. Next slide. Uh, a, a, a world where surgery is, in fact, cross-cutting and its present surgical procedures are encountered in 100% of the subcategory <coughs> of the global burden of disease. Next slide. Uh, also world where the number of surgeries performed matters and in fact there's a number somewhere around 6,000 procedures per 100,000 that is necessary to have good life expectancy, good outcomes. We don't need to go all the way to the end of that blue uh, rectangle uh, to the North American values of, of uh, 30,000 procedures per 100,000 but we do need a minimum. And in fact, in a world where the poorest third of the population only receives 6% of the procedures done globally. Next slide. Also, a place where, um, where the number of, uh, of providers is critical. And a minimum of somewhere between 20 to 40 surgery, anesthesia, and obstetrics providers per 100,000 is required, again, for good outcomes. And yet, a place where, again, the third of the population only receives 12% of the specialist surgical workforce. Next slide. The last commission also uh, addressed the three delays in surgery that occur uh, in seeking care, in reaching care, and in receiving care. And when it comes to receiving care, if I can have the next slide, please. They, they provided the, um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, they provided the, uh, the concept, they introduced the concept of the bellwether procedures, cesarean delivery, treatment of open fractures, and laparotomy. These are procedures that when they're provided, offered in any institution, in any hospital, that hospital is generally accepted to be able to provide sur appropriate surgical care for all that is essential surgery. Next slide. Also, the Lancet looked at the, at the financing of surgery and found in the first place that in fact surgery is a very cost-effective measure. And on this graph you see the, uh, the cost-effectiveness of surgical procedures on top compared to some medical interventions such as HIV care and found them to be not only equal in effectiveness but sometimes cheaper than the medical interventions. Next slide. <clears throat> and finally that in fact not addressing the burden of surgical disease, especially in low-income countries, leads to a loss, a significant loss, up to 2% of the gross do domestic product in those countries. Next slide. So again, the Lancet Commission came up with a set of six <coughs> indicators for surgical access. Access to bellwether procedures within two hours, uh, a specific surgery anesthesia and obstetrics workforce density, a minimum surgical volume, a specific um, perioperative mortality, and finally protection against both impoverishing and catastrophic expenditures. And next slide. And then gather these, uh, these into a surgical dashboard. And here's an example for the country of Zambia, where in fact every national, uh, national uh, healthcare system can, can provide these indicators and they can also be used, of course, for monitoring progress in each one of these countries. This is the effort in for the, of the, the recent effort in the Lancet Commission. But we, ha we can have the next slide, please. But very little has been done within the subspecialties. And this is something that we'd like to highlight to you how each individual surgical specialty can actually 
gather this information and move forward in global surgery. And this is uh, the example from pediatric surgery, my own specialty. Um, we have now a global initiative for children's surgery, which primarily brought together surgical providers from low-income countries from a variety of specialties, not just surgery, but also anesthesia, intensive care, pediatrics, who identify the major challenges. They generated solutions and, in fact, prioritized those solutions. And then our role is through partnerships to match these needs with existing resources. And we've just had our last week, in fact, our first meeting in London, UK, uh, the, when we analyzed and planned together with our providers from low-income countries, and we're planning in, in Washington, D.C. in October to have our implementation meeting. Uh, next slide. I think I will be stopping at this point and allowing uh, John to continue from with the view from the ground. Thank you. Uh, let me let me just intervene before John before you start, John. Um, and thanks, Dan, for that, that launching. Let's go to um, let's go to our colleagues at Hopkins. Uh, and before I, uh, I put our question to uh, I see Mike there in the room. Um, uh, I know that uh, people in our audience have varying degrees of understanding of, of some of these acronyms in, in global surgery and experience, but I know there's a lot of interest in there. Um, uh, you'll hear the term LMIC a lot through this presentation. What used to be called the third world or the developing world is now more appropriately referred to as low and middle in income countries. So that's what you hear. So Mike, um, we heard Dan uh, kind of lay the table, establish the context for the need. How, how effectively can general surgeons, particularly those of us uh, in the West, really meet the needs uh, of essential surgery uh, as, as you just heard it described? You, You've had some experience, uh, particularly in Asia. Um, uh, how are we prepared uh, to help support this uh, unmet need? Well, part of it is even just shifting the discussion. And I love the way Dan set the framework from viewing international surgery, international health initiatives as a, basically a travelogue of itinerant experiences to really trying to have a sustained big picture perspective of looking at needs, looking at infrastructure needs, looking at equity, distribution of resources, looking at outcomes and impact, and trying to look at how can we leverage what we bring to the table. And one of the, the strengths of SAGES that you've been involved with um, has been looking at leveraging technology like laparoscopy in developing countries to help them leapfrog their health care forward. Um, Ray Price has some great slide sets of an area in Mongolia where in 2004, 6% of their um, cholecystectomies were done laparoscopically in an endemic area, and now that's over 80% in a collaborative effort, not just itinerant, but looking for a local clinical champion to have a sustained program where then the government took ownership and made it spread world or globally throughout the country. What's interesting, as an aside, is leveraging the big picture thinking of the same people that network to do general surgery and laparoscopy were the people doing trauma care, the people doing, you know, broad spectrum of care, and by networking them and having people with vision, they started to realize issues of inequities in distribution of trauma care. So now ATLS is being introduced in that same region by those same surgeons. So I could go on, but I think just shifting the discussion from, gee, I could get to go do international health as a travel opportunity to we can really have impact leveraging what we bring to the table. Great comments. Thank you, uh, Mike. Let's move on now to, uh, to Dr. Tarkley. John, um, uh, love to hear your thoughts now. Thank you very much. and. Uh, I'm very glad to be uh, to participate, and I agree 100% with what Mike just said, and thank uh, Dan for starting things off. So next slide, please. Each one of us probably has our own personal list, and I'm going to talk about my personal list of six major surgical challenges, and that's in quotation marks. Uh, I also have a very active uh, interest in uh, anesthesia, and I, I maintain that it's really risk-taking behavior. Uh, to undergo a general anesthetic in probably the majority of the hospitals in sub-Saharan Africa. And we as surgeons, whether we're orthopedists or obstetricians or general surgeons or pediatric surgeons especially, really cannot function if we don't have safe airway and anesthesia management. So I think that's foundational bottom line, not assumed, not available, a real crisis. Trauma, 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 as Mike mentioned, is a huge big problem. 
we've got to prevent trauma, long bone fractures, spine and head trauma, and what I did not appreciate before my 15 years in Nigeria is that burns, thermal trauma, is an absolute disaster, requires immense resources, personnel, time, and often they present late and are really, really difficult uh, to take care of. Women's health and antenatal, perinatal care are huge issues. Cancer is on the ascendancy. Pediatric surgery has been mentioned, but specifically neonates and infants. And finally, analgesia, perioperative pain management, and palliative care. So we will go quickly through these six, and then I will turn it back over to Dan. Next, please. So safe anesthesia and airway management, we got to have it. If you can take a neonate that has intestinal atresia and can successfully provide safe anesthesia and operative care for this child, that is an index of the capacity for your medical center, for your hospital. Next. So oxygen is obviously an important part of that paradigm. You need to be able to have oxygen, but oftentimes cylinders are not available. Uh, they're industrial actions, and uh, the, the companies that provide this, uh, <coughs> this important resource are not available, and you have to be creative. Next. So we ran into this problem in Nigeria uh, in the prior decades where we did not have cylinders, we did not have oxygen, yet we needed to do emergency procedures. And our friends at Hopkins, Agnes Brooker and others helped us. And so we have plenty of air. So this again gets down to a kind of innovation on the ground where you have necessity mandating you come up with solutions. So if we don't have oxygen, we do have air. We can compress air. We can put it through the cyclopropane yoke. Next slide. We can then use an oxygen concentrator to enrich what was at that time halothane that we were using. And so we can volatilize our anesthetic agent with the freshly compressed air. We can enrich it with the uh, oxygen at five liters per minute next, such that we're able to provide uh, ongoing safe anesthesia care, even if we don't have uh, oxygen cylinders that we would obtain or manufacture for ourselves. So this is one of our residents in our training program in Nigeria, and all of our trainees have a very extensive exposure to anesthesia and safe airway management. Next. Pulse oximetry is really important. The anesthesia community is out there ahead of us. They're doing a great job. There are very many pulse oximeters. This is Life Boxes, which has been developed. Uh, it's, a, it's very durable, it's affordable, and this is really, it needs to be in every emergency room, uh, it needs to be in every hospital, and it needs to be in, in every pediatric uh, neonatal unit if there is such a, a unit in your facility. Next. So what about uh, uh, critical care? This has basically been stated to be not possible but some creative folks at Kajabi Hospital outside of Nairobi said, well, let's, let's look and see for proof of principle, can we provide critical care at a rural uh, faith-based hospital? So this is Riviella and Letchford and Newton and Achang. Uh, is it too costly, too complicated? Personnel is a problem. Equipment and maintenance. The developing world is littered with broken equipment. Can we, in a stepwise manner, create sustainable technology that is appropriate and integrate it into the continuum of care. Next. And they were able to do this. Uh, there is an, a, a unit in the Kajabi Hospital and it has made a difference. You can see this does not look like your ICU, but the important components and parts are there. Again, innovation. What do we need? What's the available technology? How can we pull this off? Next slide. Moving on from anesthesia and critical care to trauma, this is from the World Health Organization and uh, Charlie Mock, who is at the University of Washington, who's a leader in this area. But really, there are more deaths from trauma and injury than from HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. About a third <laughs> more deaths, and about a 10% of the deaths worldwide uh, are from trauma. Next. So this is uh, an interview with Haile DeBoss, who is one of our leaders and who is very, very important in Disease Control Priorities, Volume 3. And DeBoss states that we have a global epidemic of trauma greater than AIDS or malaria. Trauma care is rudimentary in Sub-Saharan Africa. We need trauma systems, and systems is a key word. This is not like parachuting in, 
doing something for a week or two. This is building systems, sustainability, capacity building on the ground over time. He says we could use cell phone technology, wireless networks, global health needs to be part of our foreign policy. We need a diplomacy of health. Next slide. So this is uh, just one example, recent literature about management of burns. And the bottom line is, is that pre-hospital transport, initial care and resuscitation are challenges. And many of our hospitals don't even have a Hombi knife. So burns are just a disaster for us. And this is one area for prevention and for improved management in our low and middle income countries. Next. So again, getting to real innovation number two that I will talk about is that we have trauma patients. This lady was actually shot at close range with a homemade shotgun. It destroyed part of her colon, lots of her small bowel. So she had small bowel resections. She had a sigmoid resection and basically a Hartman's with an end stoma. But there are no stoma therapists. There are really no stoma bags. But she's got to do something. So with a tin can, an inner tube, a piece of string, and a bread bag, a nylon bag, like you a freezer bag, uh, you can make this work for the first three to six months that she uh, needs until you can reestablish alimentary continuity. Again, what's the challenge? What are your resources? What can you do? This is not ideal. Guess what? It works. Next. <laughs> Moving on to women's health. Uh, this is a lady with vesicovaginal fistula and the depression is apparent on her face. Her life is destroyed. She has the constant drainage of urine. She's a social pariah. She's an outcast from her husband back to her family. This is a disaster and is really the indicator of the inadequacy of perinatal care if a vesicovaginal fistula occurs. Next. So if you look at the lifetime risk of death in childbirth, it's stated to be one in seven in Angola, about one in 4,000 in most of Europe, and I found one statistic of about one in 30,000 in Sweden. This is the greatest differentiation between the haves and the have-nots in the public health arena. It is a risk to your life to become pregnant, to deliver a child, and yet socially it is mandated for the women, uh, and they must have offspring. Uh, it's just incredibly important. And it, it is this is the leading cause of death in sub-Saharan Africa. And in Nigeria, we quote that uh, the leading cause of death for women to 15 to 45 is childbirth and part tuition. And the leading cause of death for men 15 to 45 is trauma. And two children out of five die by the age of five. Next slide. So again, the data from around the world states that there's one maternal death every seven minutes. Almost all of these are in the least developed countries and postpartum hemorrhage, but obstructed labor, infection, there are multiple causes such that uh, this is just a disaster. It is stated that 19 women out of 20 in the rural areas who need an emergency C-section don't get it. I've tracked down those statistics and I can't verify 19 out of 20, but it looks like perhaps 17 out of 20 who need an emergency C-section don't get it. Next slide. Cancer is on the ascendancy. Uh, it's a major economy issue and healthcare issue in this country, and it is a rising issue in the developing world in the LMICs. Next slide. So this breast cancer has gotten most of the uh, publicity, rightfully so. It's a major problem for us in Nigeria and across Africa, and it's in younger women, and sometimes it's uh, triple negative. Uh, next slide. Over half of uh, my patients for a decade presented with either uh, chest wall ulcers and a complaint of rashes of the breast or fixation or visible supraclavicular or axillary nodes. So this is just the Royal Cancer Report that came out late in 2014 that talks about malignant neoplasms being right up there with ischemic heart disease as the leading cause of death worldwide. Next. <laughs> This relates to human development index, and we think that staging determines outcome, but where you live, if you're in an LMIC or not. So if you live in a low human development index country, like a sub-Saharan country, there's almost a 90% uh, ratio between uh, deaths to cases. So the bottom line there with low HDI up there at the top, if you look at the number of cases and the number of deaths, you can see if you're in a LMIC, one, we have a lot of deaths. 
but also that the percentage is incredibly high. And this relates to Wilms tumors and neuroblastomas and other neoplasms. Next. If you try to have an oncology program uh, in this country on an LMIC, it's multifactorial prevention, screening, diagnosis, documenting, staging, treatment, uh, all of these things, palliating, uh, these are all require a lot of effort. We don't have tumor registries that are mature, but they are rising, and there are people from Memorial Sloan Kettering and other places, Peter Kingham and others, who are helping develop these uh, around Sub-Saharan Africa. Next. Lancet Oncology, Lancet Oncology Commission. Uh, you have a one chance, and uh, cancer is really a major problem. Maybe one in seven folks is going to be dying of cancer moving forward. Next. Lancet's got a lot of interest in global cancer and what can we do next. The Journal of Clinical Oncology, our medical oncologists devoted their entire issue in January of this year to what can medical oncologists do. We know that the drugs that we have in this country, if you think about monoclonal antibodies, are out of sight expensive. Gleevec, some of these other agents are very expensive. Uh, what can we do in a developing world country? How can we make these available and affordable? And that is a huge challenge. Next. Surgical oncologists are on board, and there was a major article by Charlie Balch and others in the recent issue of the Journal of Surgical Oncology. Next. One uh, bright spot is that though there's very little funding for global health initiatives, the NCI at the NIH actually has funding and training uh, funds and uh, you can apply for these uh, uh, supports uh, and for these grants through the NCI and this is new and we need more like this. What we need is a Gates or a PETFAR for trauma. We need a Gates or a PETFAR for cancer. We need a Gates or a PETFAR uh, for anesthesia, which we do not have at this time. Next slide. Pediatric surgery, especially neonates and infants. This child looks fine, not a problem. It's 90 degrees, but let's guess what? You take off the wrappings and you can see what's below. To manage this child, if you were to operate, anesthesia management, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome, closure, these are huge issues and you really need specialized care to take care of a, a, a neonate or an infant like this. Next slide. Uh, Daruk, who is at Yale, and Dan, who is the, between Montreal and Ethiopia now, have talked about the burden of pediatric conditions, and the pediatric surgeons are leading the way. The plastic surgeons have done a good job. We in general surgery and other areas uh, have uh, some ground to catch up on, I think, but pediatric surgery is really moving forward. Next. These are children with uh, Hirschsprung's disease. We treat most children here at less than 12 months of age, but you will see uh, five and six years old, even 10 and 12 year old children in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Next. Challenge number six is analgesia and opioids and palliation. And they are just not, we don't have good drugs. We don't have enough drugs. And the palliation uh, efforts are really rudimentary at this time. Next. This just looks at medical narcotic, not recreational narcotic, medical narcotic usage between the U.S. and Sub-Saharan Africa, 3,500 to 1 difference. Po patients post a four-hour laparotomy in Sub-Saharan African countries are often getting PO Tylenol. Next. And though we are starting, and actually uh, Uganda is ahead of most of us, but palliative care services are just now coming along as part of this total oncology package. But it's not just about oncology, but palliation is an area that needs to be improved as well. And that's the sixth. Next slide. Thank you very much, John. Let me just uh, pause for a, a comment or, or so. Um, and I'll, I'll remind uh, our viewers uh, to call the number at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so that we can get to you uh, with any questions. Let's go to Ohio State just for a minute, uh, talk to our, our colleagues there. Um, uh, let, me, let me ask you guys, uh, uh, earlier this year we heard some presentations on a presentation on frugal innovation. You guys uh, have a lot going on at, at Ohio State. Um, what are your thoughts about being able to support some of the, some of the innovations that, that uh, John's just presented here? that may not have any of the frugal innovation applications of coming back 
thoughts on the LMIC to the developing countries. But uh, any thoughts or any experience that you guys have had supporting uh, innovation in, in, in a global uh, surgical setting? Right. Thanks, Adrian. Um, we, we specifically have not. I know, obviously, of others that have. Um, you know, our, our involvement here is actually uh, quite extensive, uh, not with just LMIC countries, but other, other what we would consider to be developing countries um, who are trying to kind of catch up technologically. Uh, the one that we have the most experience with here is, is Wenzhou, China, for, in which we have a, an ongoing agreement with for uh, uh, not so much innovation for us, but innovation for them and bringing some of the technology over to them so that they can go ahead, then go ahead and learn how to, how to use it and how to apply it. Um, the only comment, and this, this isn't necessarily an answer to your question, but, but having been involved in the Global Affairs Committee for SAGES for years and a, a past co-chair, uh, one of the things that's really, the, the easy part is actually going there and teaching. Um, because we have a very good handle on that. The very, very difficult part for us is ensuring that the political landscape and the infrastructure uh, provides a sustainable model in that, in, in that uh, country or institution. Um, and that's one of the, what I consider one of the biggest challenges. Going and teaching, I mean, we, most of us do that every day, whether it's medical students or residents. <laughs> So going, going abroad and, and educating is, is quite easy. Um, but again, it, it's understanding the politics, and the politics is very different everywhere you go. Um, and making sure that that's a sustainable model. Um, and we've been in many situations where the politics dictate um, who gets to do what and what equipment goes where, and you know, equipment goes into storage, can't be used by certain people. Um, and that's a challenge. I'll be honest with you. So it's it's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of work. That's actually a, that's an interesting comment and actually a great segue into uh, where Dan's uh, going to take us in this next uh, section. Dan, let me hand back to you. Thank you. Um, I want to take us uh, back to the academic perspective. If I can have the next slide, uh, if we're to to devise a new, uh, to innovate, indeed, a new specialty. How are we going to do this? Um, this little graph shows us how publications help in this. And if you just look at the uh, blue line, which is the publications in global surgery as opposed to the tropical surgery and the just rising academic global surgery, you see the incre incredible increase over the past um, couple of decades in this uh, discipline. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, the, the focus of, of um, global surgery as an academic discipline is on the burden of disease and how to alleviate it. And the metric for that are the DALIs, the Disability Adjusted Life Years, which is simply a health gap indicator. It's that gray zone in zone B there between good health and death. Next slide. The DALIs are, are calculated in quite an easy way by adding the mortality to the morbidity in any given case. And there, for the morbidity, you have the factor, the disability weight, or DW, which is the one that equalizes all conditions, uh, regardless of whether they are surgical or medical. Next slide. <coughs> once, once you use DALIs, the world appears differently. Here's a comparison of low-income low countries uh, at the bottom and high-income countries um, um, at the top. And you see the blue area, which is non-communicable diseases, uh, overwhelming, of course, in our settings, but a large communicable disease uh, component in red uh, at the bottom. And trauma in green, present in both settings significantly. Next slide. There was another innovation that was necessary because the DALIs were not set up for surgery. And this happened in 2010 when, they, when we divided the, uh, the, the surgical disease into a met need, an unmet need, and the unmeetable need, which allowed us to calculate, therefore, what the impact of surgery was. Next slide. Another need was to identify, to calculate disability weight. For many of us, especially in the subspecialties, the data available so far is not sufficient to calculate that. So we had to do it from the ground up, and that's an, this is an example where we calculated this for several pediatric <coughs> surgical conditions, 
into settings in Canada on green and Kenya on blue. And it's remarkable how similar these disability weights were among the, in the two settings. Next slide. Once we had this, we're able to see, to, to actually uh, evaluate the impact of our surgery. The blue bars represent the actual dallies which were met, uh, the burden which was averted in various disciplines, quite different from the line which represents the actual numbers of those procedures. Next slide. Another innovation was, uh, was identifying that there's a fourth category, that of the delayed met need. That is the burden of disease that is suffered by, for example, a 15-year-old boy with cleft lip, who even when we do the surgery at the age of 15, has suffered for 14 and a half years and incurred a, a calculable um, burden of disease. Next slide. When we used this, uh, uh, this averted burden, delayed averted burden, we actually were able to compare this in high-income countries, and there's a, uh, there's a, a, ca a Canadian site in uh, blue and a, a low-income country in red. And of course, you expect the burden to be much higher in the low-income countries, but it's interesting that at least in our Canadian setting, there is a significant burden from waiting on our surgical wait lists, and that's very significant and usable for our wait, wait list advocacy. Next slide. We also were able for the first time to, uh, to calculate the surgical backlog of various conditions uh, based on the age at which we operate on these children. And here's an example for cleft lips. Globally, we estimated over 300,000 uh, children who are waiting with unrepaired cleft lips and palates in Africa as well as in Southeast Asia. Next slide. We're also able to replicate the cost-effectiveness studies within our specialties, and here's an example of complex surgeries at one site in Bethany Kids in Kenya. Uh, most of these across specialties uh, being performed for less than $100 per dally, and that's Canadian dollars. The, um, and finally, we're able to actually calculate a global impact, economic <coughs> impact, um, for, for, in this case, for example, cleft lip repairs, which comes to, it, to values in the billions, three to five billions of dollars uh, from the work of one charity alone globally. Next slide. But we mentioned that training is also very important. And training is predicated, of course, by the need of workforce. If you look at, the, at Africa, the tiniest circle on the left of that graph, with, the, uh, with a minimal percentage of the global workforce and yet a great burden of disease. Next slide. Uh, another example is uh, within our specialty of pediatric surgery, uh, just for eight African countries, it was estimated that the need was for 775 extra pediatric surgeons just for those countries. How do we do that? Next slide. Probably the main innovation has been the development of the colleges of surgeons across Africa uh, both the West African and the East Central and Southern African College of Surgeons, which have led to very significant <coughs> training of, surgical, of surgeons. Next slide. Another worthwhile uh, impact has, has been uh, made by the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, which proved that a rural-based surgical training program is very effective. In fact, next slide, if you can look at its scorecard, one sees that um, that already uh, 68 uh, residents are in training and 56 would have graduated by the end of this year in three specialties. What's most in significant is that all of these live in Africa, all living graduates. One of them died in Sierra Leone during the Ebola epidemic. Uh, but the other ones are all practicing in Africa and eight of them are in fact faculty at various university or hospital uh, institutions. Next slide. In our own pediatric surgical specialty, we've had this a small pediatric surgical training program for three years, for several years, uh, in partnership with the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons and the College of Surgeons of East Central Southern Africa. And we've now had eight fellows that have been in training through this program. Next slide. And again, what our pride is, is that, uh, is that on this slide, six out of the six of these surgeons in the practice in their home countries in pediatric surgery for those in need. Next slide. And finally, just a word about, uh, about um, scholarship. Scholarship is very important, first of all, to provide what I like to call LMIC-centric scholarship. This is the information that our providers in low-resource countries need 
to make their decisions, not using Western publications, but using those that are in their appropriate context. But also, next slide, scholarship is needed for advocacy. And that has been a very important part of global surgery, advocating for the role and the resources within pediatric surgery, within, uh, within global surgery. Um, next slide. I think that this is the end of my part, and I'll leave it now to John to finish. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Let me just, before John uh, kind of wraps this up, uh, let's go to our, our, our colleagues in, uh, at Mount Sinai. Um, an awful lot of very compelling uh, data, uh, uh, immense need. Um, it, within your residency program, um, what opportunities are there uh, for faculty and for trainees to be, uh, not just have an exposure to, but to contribute to meeting this, this need? Good morning, Adrian. Uh, congratulations on a great presentation, um, Barry and Abnett. I'm new. Um, we have at Mount Sinai a global um, healthcare institute, um, which has been charged with um, uh, fostering the mission of global health. And in the Department of Surgery, up, up until recent times, really it's been uh, individual surgeons doing mission work, um, taking one or two residents with them um, on these trips, and it really has been somewhat unorganized. But about a decade ago or so, uh, we began uh, a formal rotation in the Dominican Republic uh, where our PGY-3 residents rotate there uh, for, uh, I believe, an eight-week period of time. And it's a funded um, rotation. And as you know, those, those are now um, residents who go abroad are given credit by the American Board of Surgery for their, um, for their cases that are done overseas. And I will say, watching our residents um, leave to go to that rotation, when they come back, they are transformed. I'm um, having worked in a, a developing environment with minimal resources and coming back to New York City where we have a plethora of availability of resources. And it really has um, been a tremendous um, uh, thing to watch our residents grow. Um, at the departmental level, we've identified a funder uh, a fund, uh, a donor, and have um, are in the process of building um, a two uh, two surgery, uh, two operating room surgery center um, about 250 kilometers outside of um, Kampala in Uganda. And uh, our health system chairman, Dr. Marin, um, visited that site with the donor, and it's under construction. And we envision that also being a place where our surgery residents can go, um, participate in care, but also learn in the process. Um, regarding PACs, I think that that model, um, the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, is a, a model that leads to sustainability. And many of these initiatives that, we, that I refer to are not sustainable because resources dry up and training the local workforce is key. And if you look at PACs, the attrition rate is zero. 100% of the surgeons that go through that program stay in the program uh, and stay in Africa to participate in care and ongoing training. So I think finding the right blend of, um, of sending our trainees, uh, stimulating interest early in one's career, um, and, and merging that with a sustainable model like the PACS model uh, will allow global health to further penetrate um, our academic uh, training here in the United States. I'd like to, again, thank the presenters for just a wonderful presentation this morning. And it certainly um, has been daunting uh, what you presented uh, with many, many challenges. But um, thank you so much. Thanks, Barry. Those are those are wonderful comments, and I think that uh, and I think that um, both uh, John and, and Dan would be pleased to hear again the the concept of sustainability reinforced here. Um, there are there are many ways that these projects um, and uh, both of them have very graciously avoided talking about surgical safaris. Um, but uh, through the model of PACS and others, there, there really is a, a, a wonderful move that that whether you're involved in academic medicine or not, uh, there's opportunity to serve in a sustained way or provide to a sustained or uh, contribute to it. Anyway, John, let me hand back to you. Thank you very much. And uh, just following up on that, I think capacity building, on the ground, sustainability, these are all critically important. Now, if you think about your upper extremity or any muscle group, we have agonist and antagonist. And I think we have to be uh, realistic and have both enthusiasm but also reality uh, testing. So I want to kind of conclude with as we look to the future, I think we do have some hopes, but I think there are also some warnings that we can think about going forward. Next slide, please. 
as we looked at health for all at the end of the last century and the last millennium, and we talked about the pathology of poverty, really the economics, the political, the social, the medical, they're multifactorial. The medical piece is maybe the easiest of these four. Clinton said it's the economy's uh, stupid. Uh, politics or everything and uh, uh, just the social <coughs> fabric uh, that each country, each area has is really important. Next slide. Catherine DeVise uh, shared this with me, but if we think about what we need to function, uh, Atlanta could not become an economic center until they had uh, air conditioning, frankly, and air conditioning was as critical to Atlanta as heat is to Twin Cities. We depend on electricity. We depend on infrastructure. And I maintain that one of the huge challenges that's not medical but affects medical is that we don't have adequate electrification throughout sub-Saharan Africa. And it's very hard to practice without sanitary engineering, without dependable water supplies, without dependable electricity, and for most of us 21st century surgeons, without Wi-Fi and the internet and things that we've come to depend upon. Next slide. If we go back several centuries and we think about uh, Drura and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and I'm not talking Notre Dame football right now, but death is plentiful. We've got wars on several fronts and terrorism. We've got famine going on. I mean, last year we were worried about floods in Malawi and Zambia. Now we have droughts and then plague. After all of our problems in sub-Saharan Africa, bang, here comes Ebola. So we are really dealing with a lot of adversity uh, in sub-Saharan Africa right now. Next. So that I was asked several years ago about how can we develop quality care in developing world countries? What can be our strategy? What are some of the ways that we can address this? Next slide. So I recommended that our people think about Kinko's. So Kinko's talks about uh, the uh, cheap, uh, uh, quality, and fast. Next slide. Pick two. So, what is what is your what is your uh, time frame? What are your resources? What are you trying to accomplish? Now, getting back to sages and AAS and other societies, this is important. Fiemu and Moriaku is uh, at uh, the, the Global Health Center at the UT Southwestern pres presently. Uh, when he was president of AAS several years ago, uh, he initiated a movement where AAS goes to the West Africa College of Surgeons and also the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa at their invitation and they put on what we would call postgraduate courses just like we have at the ACS every year in October or so and they put on courses. Uh, Bruce McFadgen has put on uh, MIS courses, uh, there have been ultrasound courses, how to write research grants, how to write publications and edit them and endocrine uh, postgraduate courses so one of the things that SAGES has done and AAS and other groups have done follows up on FEMIO, FEMO's uh, think that one of the things that we individually and in our societies is to try to contribute to the technical and the intellectual expertise transfer. This is what Ray Price does as he over 10 or 15 years introduces MIS to a country sustained over time uh, in Mongolia. Next slide. So the Lancet we've talked about, we started with this, 5 billion don't have access to safe anesthesia and surgical care. We don't do enough procedures. There's an inequity between the West and the developing world countries. Investments in surgery and anesthesia services, that's an equity investment and it should be an indivisible, indispensable part of healthcare. Next. So Paul Farmer talks about the four S's. And so we have, we need stuff and space, but what we really need are systems. This is again not uh, uh, surgical tourism. This is about hard work supporting people on the ground. Not everybody's going to go and live in Nigeria or Kenya for 15 or 20 years, but folks can, instead of going to uh, their plush vacations, they could go alternate years every year and spend a week or two at the same place, learn that culture, learn those individuals, and do CME courses each year, see what can be progressed moving forward, but building systems really seems to be the key for sustainability moving forward. Next. 
So again, fin, uh, Sam uh, at Utah Finlayson uh, says, well, how should academic surgeons respond to all you enthusiasts out there? Uh, and what he says is we need to hold you to the same high standards academically that we do for people in outcomes research and translational research and basic science research. Next. And Kelvin, as we all know, says that basically when you can measure something, you know something about it. Hopefully to measure is to know, and if you can measure it, you can improve it. So we need to not only have incredibly uh, telling stories that uh, uh, attack the emotions of our viewers about 19 women out of 20 can't get a c-section we need to have data and I think this is one of the things the Lancet Commission has basically tried to say is a good story is important but we've got to have data we've got to show benefit we have to show that this investment uh, is a equitable investment for people moving forward whether it is a philanthropic organization a ministry of health or a government next slide I was encouraged at Blantyre this last December. The gentlemen on the right here are folks that are graduating from the COSEXA training program, and they are from government hospitals, they're from PACS hospitals, and it was terrific. The women on the left, one is a Finnish general surgeon, the lady in the middle is a urologic a surgeon, and another training general surgeon there. There are some bright, motivated, wonderful, creative folks that want to help their people. And we have the opportunity to not get in front of them, not tell them what to do, but to help them, encourage them, and support them if we wish. Next slide. William Fagey was with World, uh, with the WHO, then he was with the Carter Center, but he basically said the world cannot be allowed to exist half healthy and half sick. And I think what Dan showed with his presentations is that right now we have an inequity which is really should not be tolerable by those of us who think that we can make a difference. Next. So in the main uh, name lectureship at the COSEXA meeting in Blantyre, Trevor Crofts, who's from Edinburgh but has spent most of the time around the world, he asked about global uh, surgery. Is, it, is this really a reality or is this just uh, us blowing smoke? And I think he makes a strong point that Africa will solve Africa's problems. Hopefully we can help and we can catalyze as asked, but Africa will solve Africa's problems. Government budgets may not be able to uh, afford to employ the increased number of physicians, the economy, the social structure. It is so complicated. And he concluded with the three H's. He, 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 he warned about hubris. He encouraged humility. And he encouraged us to continue in our humanitarian efforts but we need to do it with uh, strategy and do it decently and in order. Next slide. So kind of talking about uh, articles that would be worthwhile you looking at, there's a, a, a recent article in Military Medicine this last month on optimism and the global health curve. There's terrific series. Uh, there's an article and three or four responses in the Journal of Neurosurgery for Pediatrics by Leland Albright with response by Ben Worf, who's a major player in Uganda, uh, by folks from the Republic of South Africa, people from the University of Toronto. But I would encourage interested folks. And this, this brings up some of the yin and the yang, if you will, between what we can do and the unintended consequences that can occur. But the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, April 2016, is a, a really important read uh, for the interested person. Next slide. A recent book that's just come out is talking about hoping to help. There is a place for the short-term volunteer. We had a urologist from Kerrville, Texas that came two or three different times, and he transformed our ability to do cystoscopy, changed the way we did prostatectomies, taught us how to do direct vision internal urethrotomy. These were presented at the West Africa College of Surgeons. And over time, the way that we do many procedures in West Africa was influenced by one surgeon in community practice who spent two weeks, three years in a row, and helped improve urologic care for our area. There are ways to plug in ongoing systems where there are residents and training and help grow, if you will, the expertise locally. Next. So past, present, and future wrapping up. 
Uh, it, it used to be colonialism. It's morphed to globalism and multinationalism. Uh, nationalism. It was tropical health. Now it's global. It used to be mission and faith-based, and it still is, but also humanitarian, volunteerism, NGOs. There have been partnerships, universities with resource challenge institutions, so-called twinning, increased foundation support to supplement government aid. And next slide. I really think that uh, we have, are in an era of cautious optimism and opportunity, and I hope that we don't blow it away. Uh, next slide. Uh, Albert Hubbard, quoted in one of these uh, journal neuros neurosurgery pediatric article, stated that there is no failure except in no longer trying. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John and Dan, and we come um, to the end of our time here, and I uh, want to thank you both for such a rich and, and informative uh, presentation for sharing your expertise, your experience, and uh, while presenting some very sobering data, really, I think, leaving us with some encouraging and, and even uh, inspiring us to the opportunities available, really, to, to, to all of us. Um, so thank you very much. I'll remind all our viewers that there is no broadcast in July. Uh, we recommence on August 5th, and uh, Phil Shower will be uh, moderating that presentation. So once again, to uh, uh, all of you attended, and especially to uh, John and Dan, thank you so much for uh, a wonderful program.